If you study the development of the fantasies of very, very dark people, you see that they brood and fantasize in isolation for years. And the fantasies get darker and darker and darker. So they're bitter and resentful to begin with. And then they start fantasizing about, well, what they would want. That can take a sexual end, or it can take a very violent end, or it can take both. And what they're really after is the ultimate in revenge. And on the sexual front, they find a kick in extending the, what would you call it, unacceptability of the fantasy one stage at a time. Um, the, the famous and extremely attractive sexual serial killer, what was his name? It's a famous photograph of him like this, very attractive man. Do you, do you remember his Ted name? Bundy. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy detailed out exactly how his fantasies progressed as he became more and more involved with pornography. And what happens in some sense is that these people who are nursing these terrible fantasies want to stay on the edge of novelty. And so their fantasies get darker and darker and darker as they progress down that road. And so after a thousand such micro progressions, they end up in exactly the sort of pit that you're describing. And some of that is pure sexual kick because of the novelty. And, but it's got this sadistic and perverse, uh, vengeful twist. And you could think about it this way. You know, I think it says in the Gospels that, you know, it would be better that, that a millstone was hung around your neck and that you were cast into the abyss than to do harm to any of God's children, let's say. And the, that's actually where the perverse delight comes because the most egregious possible sin let's say, is the violent sexual abuse of the most innocent possible person. And the perverse novelty kick is highest at exactly that point. And then that just goes from bad to worse. And there's a thousand or even 10,000 micro decisions that go along with that. There's also a great book called Ordinary Men. This is well worth reading, although it's a bloody catastrophe to read, I'll tell you. It details out how a group of German policemen who were moved to Poland during World War II were transformed from ordinary middle-class, working-class, or sorry, ordinary working-class men, um, old enough to not have been raised under the Nazi regime, by the way, and so not propagandized into a kind of mindless obedience, how they went from being perfectly ordinary policemen to the sort of people who could take naked pregnant women out into the middle of a field and shoot them in the back of the head. And it isn't like they had an easy time with that. Some of them reported the same sort of thing that you reported when you first watched that video. They, they, what they were being called upon to do stage by stage made them physically ill. And they had a commander who actually had told them that they could leave the service if they didn't want to continue with their duties. But they felt duty bound not to leave, leave their comrades having to mop up the terrible situation. But it does a lovely job of detailing out how your movement from normality to absolute perversity is a consequence of 10,000 micro, um, what would you say, micro violations of your own conscience, not all of them micro, obviously. So you know, you need to know about the vengefulness, you need to know about the kick of sadism, that's that novelty kick that produces a dopaminergic kick that heightens sexual satisfaction. And so there's an, there's an element of sadistic misery that can add novelty to sex. That's particularly attractive to people who are bitter and resentful because they actually can't find any willing sexual partners. And so they're angry at the world and shake their fist at God because of it. And so anyways, that's a bit of the developmental course of such, of such a lovely descent into hell. And, and the interesting thing about it is that people brood, eh? Like you don't get to the point where you're watching pornographic videos of children being raped without hundreds or even thousands of hours of de increasingly demented voluntary fantasy. And that's that allowing the spirit of sin that would otherwise crouch on your doorstep to enter your house and have its way with you, right? It's like a collaborative venture with Satan himself. That's the most straightforward way of describing it. And so, well, so that's, I don't know what you have to say about that, but I'll let you have at her. I'll say this, that everything you're saying absolutely resonates with my anecdotal experiences dealing with these people. Uh, I look into their eyes and what you're describing is what I see, though I've never been able to articulate it uh, like you just have. So I appreciate being armed with, with, um, with an, an understanding that it will help me uh, 
evangelize more clearly to others about the, the dangers of 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 overstimulation and overuse of, por of pornography and and shaking hands with the devil. So thank you for that. That was very insightful. So I I spent a bit of time, um, not a lot, but a bit of time inside a Maxim security prison when I was a kid. I worked with a very strange psychologist that was there. And one of the things that really shocked me, and I, I think this shocked me enough to change my whole life, was I, I met these, I met this one prisoner who was a pretty nondescript looking character. He took me for a walk out in the yard away from a gym full of like weightlifting axe murderer monsters and rapists. And we went for a walk out in the yard and the psychologist called us back and told me later in the office that this guy who was about 5'2", pretty non-prepossessing guy, had uh, made two policemen kneel in front of him, beg for their lives in reference to their families, and then shot them both in the back of the head and, and kicked them aside. And the shocking thing to me was, you know, you, you kind of think that if you met pure evil, it would, it would have a monstrous form. And, you know, the thing that shocked me about that was the nondescript nature of this guy. You know, his, his absolutely banal ordinariness, the fact that you could just walk past him on the street and you'd never know. He wasn't some monster, you know, the monstrous character of Satan in your imagination is, you know, a figure that's terrifying to behold instead of someone normal, you know what I mean? Normal in that cringing sense. These people that you've interacted with, like what's your what's your reaction to them when you talk to them, the pedophiles, when you talk to them and when you arrest them? My experience is very similar to what you just described. Very nondescript, people of all walks of life. We've 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 arrested and I've interrogated um, educators, uh, lawyers, law enforcement, clergymen. Um, and and uh, sitting across from them, there's but with no apparent physicality that would tell you who they are. But I will say this: when they start talking and I look into their eyes, that's when I can I sense something that that it, that's really scares the hell out of me. Um, and the way they talk about children when they get there, and it's it's something that they've been able to normalize. And they're speaking to me about children almost like they're talking about, you know, a, 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 the weather or, you know, talking about buying and selling children like you talk about buying and selling computer parts or, or an automobile or something. And that's where I thought you, something has taken over you. Something non-human has made you less human. Um, and I've never been able to figure it out, uh, only that it creeps me out. And, and, um, and I usually end up getting them to confess because they have brought themselves to a place where they think they're okay. They think that it's somehow normal. I don't know if that makes sense yeah, how do to they, you, Dr. Peterson. Well, why the, well, well, well the, the degree of rationalization that has to, with each, with each step forward in the progress of the fantasy, there has to be a step forward in the self-deception with regards to self-description, right? So imagine that you're, you're attempting to cling to a sense of yourself at least as normal, but even maybe as a moral agent. I mean, the, the more forthright pedophiles claim that they're only allowing children to express their true sexual desires and that what they're actually doing is forming the best relationship with the children that they've ever had. Now, of course, there's part of them that knows that that's an absolutely bloody, screaming, hellish lie. But you get to that lie, like I said, with a thousand micro lies, right? And you're modifying your self-conception along the way. I mean... Have you had these people justify themselves to you? And if so, by what means do they attempt to do that? So one person that comes to mind, absolutely, the answer is yes. And one person that comes to mind is the person depicted in the film, Oshensky. Uh, this person had written uh, articles, self-published, of course. He had a book that he actually sold on Amazon. And his understanding or his, his justification was that the puritanical society of this country has crushed the true uh, and, 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 and beautiful and righteous uh, sexual experience, uh, which the, the most natural would be between a man 
and a child, a prepubescent child. A prepubescent child is 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 the is the most beautiful form of humanity. And um and why why take that away from a child? Children would be well uh, conditioned to, to 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 confront the challenges of life if only they could experience orgasmic pleasure even in their prepubescence. Um, this is how they talk. Right. Right. And, right. And well, how, yeah. And they, well, that you saw echoes of that. There was attempts made in the 1970s by French intellectuals, surprise, surprise, to have the age of consent reduced radically. And that was always the rationale. It was an extension of the patriarchal oppression theory in some sense, right? That all sexual expression is essentially pure and good in its most fundamental form. And it's all warped by social pressure. And if we were just allowed to express ourselves in every manner that we saw fit, then everyone would be free and we wouldn't suffer anymore from the constraints of of tyrannical society, right? And it's just convenient for the bloody pedophiles that that happens to justify them doing whatever the hell they want to children who are obviously too young to consent. Mm -hmm. 